in White County, Georgia in October of 1870, a white woman known as Mrs. Henderson asked her neighbor, the freed woman, Mary Brown, do you know, Mary, where the, these men are going? Referring to a group of five white men collected at her store. Brown, not wishing to engage with the other woman replied, no, I don't. I am sick now and I want to trade and go home. Undeterred, Mrs. Henderson kept on asking me, as Brown would later testify, until the freed woman finally relented. She asked where the men were going and Mrs. Henderson replied, they are going to kill Kaysen, referring to Deputy Marshal John Kaysen, who was trying to arrest several members of the local clan for illicitly distilling whiskey. Brown recalled her telling me that these men were going to kill that man. I suppose she got afraid I would tell the folks of it. She said it would be a very good idea to go and give me a right good whipping or scare me away from the place. She told me what she told them and said it was because she was afraid I would tell it. Testimonies such as this taken before the 1872 Joint Select Committee to inquire into the condition of affairs in the late insurrectionary states is more than a record of the violence inflicted by the white supremacist organizations of reconstruction. It is also a map to social worlds otherwise invisible to historians. The approach of reading multiple testimonies from the same place in conjunction with one another unveils a more complete narrative, foregrounding the relationships revealed rather than the violence described. Such an approach demonstrates otherwise neglected influences and challenges stemming from the individuals examined, particularly women who have been previously overlooked or underexamined in the historiography. My research uses these sources to examine the challenge that freed women's testimony posed to the local hierarchy of white male supremacy during reconstruction and investigates white women's involvement in clan activities and their influence within the community. By reading these disparate sources as a whole and examining the circumstances leading up to and following clan attacks on households like Mary Brown's, it is possible to see the social world of reconstruction and women's roles in clan activities more clearly. Although it is widely accepted that reconstruction's violence was gendered, scholars have foregrounded white women's roles as supportive community members who participate in violent white supremacist organizations by sewing costumes rather than as active agents. Similarly, historians often represent black women as proxy victims for their male kin. Much of this scholarship does not fully reckon with the implications of women's appearance in the records or what their presence in, clan, in testimonies of clan violence might reveal about women's influence in the community. For instance, the incident described at the start of this presentation in which Mrs. Henderson first pulled Mary Brown into a discussion of a murder plot serves as a starting point for Brown's integration into the narrative of the murder and the subsequent attack on her own family. According to Brown, Henderson deliberately drew her into conversation about the impending murder, despite Brown's repeated attempts to stay disengaged from the woman. With, with Mrs. Henderson acting as an aggressor, intent on getting Brown to talk to her, Henderson, whose husband and sons were members of the local clan, then tells a leader of the clan that she had informed Brown of the murder plan. Henderson explicitly and purposefully suggests that the clan attack Mary Brown because of that knowledge. Despite the clear significance of her active role in the violence inflicted on the Brown household, Mrs. Henderson has yet to be given sufficient attention in any examination of the assault that I have found. My readings of these sources suggest that local clan members could target black women precisely because of the direct action political power established by their ability to communicate wrongs they experienced as both victims and witnesses. Although the majority of targets of clan violence may have been male, I argue that black women, including many of those who were attacked alongside or in place of male family members, were often also attacked because of their ability to bear witness to the crimes of white men. Furthermore, white women like Mrs. Henderson were involved in the violence in ways that went well beyond sewing costumes, including selecting targets for violence based on intelligence gathered through women's social networks. Examining the range of ways that women, both black and white, participated in and were targets of Klan violence is vital to fully understand the scope of post-war struggles. Like Mary Brown and Mrs. Henderson, women were active historical agents in the battle for power and control in their post-war communities. Thank you.